first sight, the political career of William Sharman Crawford appears characterised by serial failure. All three of his attempts to win a parliamentary seat in his home province of Ulster for County Down in 1831, Belfast in 1832 and Down again in 1852 ended in defeat. A brief and tempestuous period as MP for the borough of Dundalk concluded with acrimony and effective deselection in 1837. With his electoral career being salvaged only through transplantation to the English industrial seat of Rochdale in 1841, which he was to represent for 11 years. Although committed to parliamentary action, he failed to attain any of his serially pursued legislative objectives during his tenure as an MP in the fields of tithe and poor law reform, democratisation of the franchise, renegotiation of the British-Irish constitutional relationship, and above all, in land reform. So this begs the question, why bother with studying this apparent uh, case of political failure? Sharma Crawford might, might perhaps command interest as one of a number of Irish radicals from landed gentry backgrounds who offered leadership to popular movements in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Daniel O'Connell himself was the most prominent of these, but strikingly many were Anglican Protestants, including obviously Henry Grattan, but also William Smith O'Brien, and somewhat, the more success, somewhat more successfully than Sharman Crawford in making the transition from Irish to British mass politics, Fergus O'Connor. And of course, Charles Stuart Parnell carried this landed Tribune tradition forward into the latter part of the century. But more specifically, despite the repeated setbacks in his political career, Sharman Crawford arguably played a pivotal role in the survival and indeed the asserted challenge of reformist politics in Ulster between the 1830s and 50s ending his career in the 50s with almost iconic status for those for most of those on the left in Irish politics, as well as in Rochdale, where a well-attended testimonial meeting in 1855 heard praise of his many virtues, his sterling honesty, his uncompromising advocacy of the cause of the people. Despite difficult periods in his, uh, in early in his career, he was also remembered as a reconciliator of northern and southern popular politics. The Catholic Freeman's Journal noted in its obituary notice that he was almost the last of the race of great men. And if honour, honesty and a loyal devotion to the rights of the Irish people be a claim to their gratitude, few deserve it better. For many in Ulster, Sharman Crawford remained the embodiment of an alternative to the politics of deference, accommodation to established elite interests and and sectarian polarisation. Denunciations of him by his political opponents as a crotchety obsessive or a deluded tool of Romanist political machinations did little to dent the standing he had attained among reformers before or after his death in 1861. Moreover, a number of the political objectives he had pioneered or promoted in the 1830s to 50s, especially in the areas of land reform, would ultimately bear fruit, bear fruit albeit in more radical form in the 1870s and 80s. To understand Sharman Crawford's politics and the nature of his radicalism, we need first to review the dilemmas facing reformist politics in Ulster in the early 19th century. The northern province, and especially its more prosperous northeastern counties, had been at the epicentre of Irish radicalism in the 1780s and 90s, as the volunteer movement, succeeded by the United Irishmen, agitated in favour of radical parliamentary reform, Irish political autonomy, later independence, and religious liberty. Of course, the radical movements themselves have been riven by internal contradictions and points of stress between different denominations and strands of Protestants, conflicting class interests, and above all, between Catholic and Protestant political aspirations. Corrosive divisions over the Catholic question were to undermine the reformist potential of the volunteer movement in the, in the mid-1780s, and where, at least ostensibly resolved by the United Irishmen, only at the price of the emergence of mass sectarian mobilisation spreading from South Ulster <coughs> under the aegis of the Orange Order. Divisions within Or Ulster reformism deepened over war and the French French alliance, and the United Irish resort to revolutionary conspiracy after seventeen ninety four. The catastrophic defeat of militant radicalism in seventeen ninety eight spread disillusionment and recrimination on the back of repression and cleared the way for the Act of Union of eighteen hundred. This was the political environment uh, created by the generation preceding that of William Sharman Crawford, well, and which created the structural legacies of the early 19th century within which he operated. His father, William Sharman, 
had been directly involved in the politics of the period and the legacy of that of the 1780s in particular was thus personal as well as general. William Sharman, a small landowner, resident at Moira Castle in County Down, was elected Colonel of the Union Regiment of Volunteers in 1782 and subsequently was Chair of the Corresponding Committee of the Ulster Corps of Volunteers. As such, he played a leading role in the volunteer conventions at Dungannon and Dublin in 1783 and 1784 that debated radical political reform and Catholic emancipation and corresponded with leading English political reformers. Uh, William Sharman's election as MP for Lisburn in 1783 was lauded as the glorious triumph of a people over an aristocracy that formerly ruled the borough and this county, and this county with a rod of iron. As an MP, Sharman adhered to the patriot position on the need to resist British colonial subordination of the Irish economy, commenting in notes for a speech lamenting the forced emigration and immiseration of the population. Great Britain, he wrote, intruded herself into this country not for the purpose of extirpation but of subjection. The linen manufacture is but the, is the only breath that is left to an asthmatic people to keep alive a feeble existence, just sufficient to produce a crop of consumers of British manufactures, just sufficient to recruit that army which was made and still keeps us as a province, just sufficient to produce those taxes which are to pay for it, or uh, if not able to do that, to become a mortgage for loans for that purpose just sufficient to produce those salaries and pensions which make it the interest of a few to connive at the humiliation of the many. Attacks such as this, as these, as this, uh, on the government, uh, uh, the government of Ireland, led to, the dis to Sharman's dismissal as the revenue collector of Lisbon in 1784. Even though the political mem momentum of the volunteer movement ran out of steam from the mid-1780s and Sharman stood down as an MP in 1790, and indeed he'd never been a prominent orator and lacked the resources to challenge the resurgent Hartford proprietary interest in 1790. He remained, however, an active and popular figure within the movement. In 1791, he presided over the Belfast Volunteer Meeting uh, that issued uh, a, meeting, uh, a, a message of welcome to the French Revolutionary uh, National Assembly. However, his relationship with the younger generation of Northern Radicals, including William Drennan and Samuel Nielsen, was strained and he withdrew from public life in 1793, before the official suppression of the Volunteers and the outbreak of war with France. And indeed the Sharmans kept a low profile in the following years uh, before William's death uh, after suffering a stroke in 1803. Now, although he had only been uh, a young child during the heady days of the Volunteer Movement, his son, William, William, Jr., uh, William Sharman Jr., inherited both his father's patriot political agenda, belief in constitutional mass agitation, and distancing from the revolutionary alternative embodied by the United Irish Movement. Writing in an unpublished autobiographical memoir in 1844, uh, William Jr. noted that notwithstanding my early years, being only 10 years old when my father retired from Parliament, I took a deep interest in all the great political questions on which I would hear him enlarging on the domestic circle of our fireside. His own brief period as an officer in the Moira Yeomanry from 1803 might have raised some awkward questions uh, about his inheritance, but the younger William rationalised this by stating that the Yeomanry by that date had lost what he described as the party, i.e. the orange character, it had acquired in the 1790s, and that it now, from 1803, offered a patriotic opposition to the threat of Napoleonic tyranny. And indeed, his subsequent open hostility to the Orange Order uh, as a magistrate in County Down would appear to support this. Thereafter, although William did not for many years take an active, uh, take a prominent part in politics, at the same time he wrote, I adhered firmly to the opinions I had received from my father's example and instruction. So very much a kind of uh, a sense of inheritance, a direct inheritance uh, from, uh, from his father's political example. Now, William's entry into political life uh, from 1830, uh, when he was in his early 50s, was due to several factors. First of all, he'd married, back in 1805, Mabel uh, Friedeswid Crawford, the daughter of John Crawford of Crawfordsburn County Down. And this was an alliance of two families closely connected by politics. John Crawford had been a major in the, major in the Volunteers and was politically close to Colonel Sharman 
in its its political activities. And indeed, or however, subsequently, he appears to have been closer to the Belfast radicals. And indeed, he was he was named as a friend of the United Irishmen in one 1798 military report, uh, which threatened him with arrest. The death of of uh, uh, the death of John Crawford's heir in 1826, followed by his own death in 1827, led to the descent of his property holdings in County Down, including Crawford's burn and the Radiman estate near Crossgar, to his daughter, and in turn um, to his daughter's husband, uh, William. In return, William Sharman adopted by royal licence the surname of Crawford, um, combining the Sharman estates near Brown Bridge, there were also small properties in counties Antrim and Meath. Um, this made him um, uh, the newly renamed William Sharman Crawford, a relatively wealthy landowner with an income of around £8,000 a year, sufficient to finance um, an independent political career. The third factor was the political crisis sparked by the intrusion of the Catholic Emancipation Campaign into Irish politics, particularly from 1826, to, uh, 1826 onwards, as Daniel O'Connell's Catholic Association be- began to mobilise large numbers of supporters and begin to contest elections. By 1829, Sharman Crawford was joining other liberal Protestants on platforms supporting repeal of Catholic disabilities and issuing statements of support, albeit with certain reservations, for O'Connell himself. By 1830, he was taking a prominent role in support of the candidacy in County Down of Colonel Ford, standing as a reformer while at the same time scrupulously assuring his tenants that they would have complete freedom to make their own political choices at the election without uh, the usual degree of proprietorial d- d- direction. Ford, who was a disaffected Tory, was uh, a poor candidate to stand in the independent interest uh, in County Down against the dominant Hill and Stewart family uh, interests in the county and was not successful. But Charman Crawford's active role in the contest raised his profile and began what was to be a frenetic political engagement that spanned the next two decades and more. There were a number of structural problems confronting Sharman Crawford as an aspirant politician in seeking to revive and adapt the political principles uh, of the 1780s to the very different political environment of the 1830s and 40s. First, then, most obviously, in Down in 1830, dominance of county elections by a small number of landed magnate families remained the norm, maintained by a mixture of deference and coercive vote management in an era before the secret ballot. Indeed, the withdrawal of the franchise from 40 shilling freehold electors in 1829 as the kind of price of Catholic emancipation had tended to increase this, and there was no significant increase in the county electorate uh, before 1851. However, this dominance, magnate dominance, was not unchallengeable, uh, as had been demonstrated by O'Connellite victories in a number of southern counties, in the 1830s, in the early 1830s. <clears throat> but it required considerable degrees of organisation, finance and political mobilisation of large numbers of electors and non-electors. Irish borough constituencies, massively reduced in number after 18, 1801, posed different problems. The Reform Act of 1832 significantly reduced proprietorial or oligarchical control, although a number of smaller boroughs remained under heavy landlord influence. But the complexities of the post-1832 franchise required constant and well-financed registry work, and the sharper property qualifications in the boroughs brought in by the Act tended to accentuate tensions between middle-class electors and the disenfranchised. Perhaps most importantly, the combination of the defeat of 1798 and the repression that followed and the subsequent Union of 1800 had transformed the political landscape. Militant radicalism never recovered amongst Ulster Protestants. It was demonstrated both by the abortive disaster of Thomas Russell's attempted rising in 1803 and again the failure in the 1840s of the radical young Irelanders John Mitchell and John Martin to revive the spirit of the United Irishmen amongst their fellow Protestant men of the North. As historians including Gerald Hall and John Bew have documented, Protestant reformist opinion in the North and even some of the United Irish survivors, came in the decades after 1800 to embrace a form of civic unionism, identifying the economic success of the North East with the Union and seeking political reform through alliances with British allies. 
In Belfast in particular, liberal middle-class politics shifted towards an alignment with British Whiggery. Uneasiness with Catholic political objectives among Presbyterians existed before 1798, but was reinforced by the scale and assertiveness of, as well as the extensive clerical participation in, the Emancipation Campaign, which was closely followed by the transition into agitation for repeal of the Union from 1830. While relatively few of the Presbyterian clergy and laity followed Henry Cook's call for a pan-Protestant Tory alliance against political Catholicism and Whiggery in 1834, it's undeniable that O'Connellism and its more radical nationalist offshoots provoked animosity and, and anxiety on the part of most Protestant liberals, while attracting growing support from Ulster Catholics. Making sense of Sharman Crawford's political career after 1830 requires an understanding both of his ideological inheritance and his attempts to negotiate and circumvent these political constraints uh, and obstacles. While demonstrating a core of consistency in political values, which might be articulated as independency, patriotism, adherence to democratic constitutional reform and to a more equitable form of landlord-tenant relations, his career also manifested a consciousness of potential political and social opportunities and, alliance and alliances changing over time and the need to move on in the wake of failed experiments. What follows is by necessity something of a broad brush survey of some of the main elements of his political career, the fine detail of which uh, you'll have to wait for the appearance of a planned book on this subject. The first phase of his career in 1831-2 demonstrated a perhaps over-optimistic confidence in the spirit of reform unleashed by the establishment of Lord Grey's Whig government in 1830 um, to bring about a reformist moment in Ulster similar to that of 1782-3. Although only a small player in county politics in terms of his acreage, Sharman Crawford put himself forward as the reform candidate for County Down at the general election called after the initial defeat of the reform bill in the Commons in uh, spring 1831. Whatever the wider support for reform and O'Connell's tacit support for his candidacy, this electoral insurgency was quashed by the combined weight of the Hill and Stuart interests. And more specifically, Crawford alleged by the intervention of Lord Downshire's chief agent to induce his tenants to vote against him. Sharman Crawford's candidacy had been supported by the Belfast Reform Association, dominated by the leading middle-class liberals of the developing industrial town, including figures like Robert Grimshaw, John McCants and R.G. Tennant. Impressed by a showing in County Down in the hustings in 1831, at one point he had been, been leading um, uh, against uh, the Stuart uh, candidate, Lord Castlereagh, uh, this body, the Belfast uh, Reform Association, invited him to stand as their endorsed candidate for the newly reformed borough of Belfast the following year alongside R.J. Tennant. Belfast was um, a, a two-member constituency, uh, so this is the, the uh, Belfast Reform Association ticket. Uh, Crawford's platform in 1832, which was for triennial parliaments, more MPs for Ireland, no taxation without representation, abolition of the tithe and of slavery, and an end to taxes on knowledge and the implementation of the principle that no class should be duly exalted at the expense of or duly depressed for the benefit of any other class, placed him at the radical end of the spectrum of candidates that year. To the great disappointment of the Belfast Radicals, Sharman Crawford and R.J. Tennant were both defeated by their opponents, Lord Arthur Chichester, the son of the town's proprietor, Lord Donegal, and James Emerson Tennant, who had run as a moderate reformer, although later identified himself with Peelite conservatism. As Gerard Hall has, suggests, has suggested, um, the new predominantly Belf Protestant middle-class electorate in the town opted for centrist caution in the context of concerns about the revolutionary antecedents of some of the Belfast Reform Association supporters and, perhaps more importantly, the threat of a revived repeal movement on which Chichester and Emerson Tennant were perceived to be more ambiguously hostile. They were also, of course, suspect uh, to others on religious grounds. Uh, as one political squib of the time had it, Belfast now beware of your radical friends, tis easy to guard against a foe, 
But these that like Judas do friendship pretend can strike the most deadly blow. Ye friends to the Protestant wheel stand forth as in duty ye are bound in electing true men of just judgment and skill for the good of your country and town. Um, and it went, this, this square went on to celebrate the fact that the vain upstart of Crawfordsburn had been sent packing. In subsequent elections, Belfast reformers would seek to reclaim these moderate bourgeois voters uh, with limited success in parliamentary elections and none in municipal elections after 1840, but very much uh, at the expense of, or, uh, of shunning radicalism and repeal. With both county and borough politics in Ulster apparently closed to him by 1832, Sharma Crawford had to look elsewhere for a renewed political strategy. His position on the Union had, as the, uh, his critics in Belfast had uh, insinuated, always been ambivalent. Although he had publicly supported the 1831 Leinster Declaration against repeal and kept the, the issue under a degree of control during the election itself. But in 1833, disillusionment with the failure of the Grey administration to deliver on expectations of sweeping political and tithe reform for Ireland, and indeed its resort to measures of coercion, led him to reconsider this position. In that year, he published a pamphlet previously serialised in the press on the expediency and necessity of a local legislative body for Ireland, setting out the case as he saw it for an Irish parliament with prescribed powers, now that the country's hopes from the reformed imperial parliament had been extinguished. This was not an argument for what O'Connell termed simple repeal, but as a second publication that year by Sharman Corford set out, the case for a national body to manage the local interests and local taxation of Ireland in connection with the Imperial Parliament. The differences between his and O'Connell's interpretations of repeal would only later be worked out in detail. For the present, O'Connell and the repeal press were more than happy to welcome Sharman Crawford as an adherent and facilitate his newfound desire to establish an alliance with the Southern Mass movement. This entailed attacks from, or this led to for, attacks from former Protestant reformist allies in Ulster uh, on, on Sharman Crawford and his publications, and indeed uh, hostile commentary in the House of Commons uh, from uh, Edward Littleton, the Secretary for Ireland. But it offered, uh, at this moment, the hope of rebuilding his political career on a national stage. He already had a foothold in the politics of Meath through uh, having a small estate at Stalin near, near Drogheda, which meant he was a, a, a Meath country gentleman. Uh, and this proved an advantage uh, in easing his way into or onto the repeal platform. And indeed, uh, uh, later that year, in facilitating the offer of a seat um, uh, for the safe O'Connellite borough of Dundalk. O'Connell himself was effusive, though no doubt conscious of Sharman Crawford's streak of stubborn independence, which was already evident in exchange of public correspondence during 1834 over the, over the question of the abolition of tithe. Um, indeed, um, O'Connell wrote privately to Sharman Crawford in September 1834, Believe me that I am both consoled and encouraged by your approbation and strengthened by your cooperation. I desire to do full and simple justice to all. I am anxious to see conscience, conscience perfectly free and to behold, behold the resources of Ireland preserved and increased by the parental protection of an Irish legislature, the only one which can achieve the object. So it's very much a stress in what O'Connell is, is saying to Sharma Crawford that they are uh, uh, engaged in the same political project. Sharma Crawford is already, even before his election, uh, suggesting that he has some reservations. In January 1835, he was returned without contest at Dundalk and entered Parliament for the first time. It was very soon evident however, that uh, he would prove no obedient member of the O'Connellite party, especially when the Irish leader entered into a political alliance with the British Whigs um, following the, the, the Litchfield House Com Compact in spring 1835, which allowed them to return to government uh, after a brief Conservative interlude uh, in April of that year. Sharman Crawford clearly relished 
his parliamentary uh, having the parliamentary seat, taking a very active role in presenting petitions, as frequently from his political heartland in down in Antrim as from his own constituency at uh, Dundalk. Uh, also intervening in debates very regularly, asking parliamentary questions. Um, he is a kind of a very uh, active parliamentarian. Above all, it permitted him to pursue his personal legislative agenda in the form of what became a nearly annual bill for the legal establishment of tenant right in Ireland, a subject that we'll return to a little bit later. Predictably, however, the relationship with O'Connell deteriorated rapidly um, from spring 1835. Uh, not initially over repeal, but over the issues of tithe and the poor law. In opposition, O'Connell's platform had included demands for the total abolition of tithe, uh, the tithe levied on agricultural land, for the exclusive support of the established church, and the return of a Whig government had been predicated on its newfound commitment to the appropriation of the surplus value of that tithe to Irish education um, and other uh, projects. Finding it impossible, however, to carry such a measure through uh, the House of Lords, the Whig government proposed instead a commutation of tithe after a proportionate reduction from the direct burden, from it being a direct burden on the occupiers of land to becoming a rent charge on the landowners, thereby removing the confrontation over collection that had sparked the tithe war in 1831, but at the cost of anticipated rent increases by landlords who are now charged with the upkeep of the costs of the church. And while O'Connell reluctantly accepted this principle as the price for maintaining an office of Whig administration that was seen to be promoting Catholic interests in Ireland, it was rejected as anathema by Sharman Crawford. Why was this the case? There are both ideological and pragmatic reasons for his stance. Although an Anglican himself by birth and upbringing, and his private papers reveal him to be a man of, of deep and sincere personal religious convictions, Sharman Crawford was by the 1830s a committed voluntarist in religious matters, a position that placed him in an antagonistic position with uh, his own denomination, the Church of Ireland, and which ultimately paved the way for an accommodation with many Ulster Presbyterians, especially in the wake of the Presbyterian marriages, uh, crisis of the early 1840s and the Scottish disru disruption of 1843, as well as a potential alliance with English nonconformists. His uncompromising position on tithe abolition reflected the rejection of the legitimacy of state funding for religion, and did he later go on also to reject um, the continuation of the Presbyterian Regium Donum, the fund, the fund made available to the Presbyterian clergy, and also uh, is a, a strong opposition to the Maynooth grant um, to fund uh, greater further funding for the Catholic seminary at Maynooth in 1845. Mm -hmm. He even expressed a suspicion which drew violent refutation from the O'Connellites that Catholics coveted the transfer of the tithe from the Church of Ireland uh, to the Catholic Church. As, as Hall has astutely noted, with an eye on his home public opinion, he was also anxious to maintain a line of separation between himself and the Liberator. Uh, he wrote to his son John in the late 1835, apropos of his latest public letter, criticising O'Connell's tithe compromise. The letter has attracted public attention and more than, more than anything that I have ever published. And I think it will be highly important in increasing my influence in Ulster because it is clearly manifest that I am not a joint in the tale of the great man. And this theme of uh, the, the kind of o the very public O'Connell, um, uh, Sharman Crawford division over the tithe class question was picked up and uh, mocked um, for a, a metropolitan audience by the uh, London Irish artist John Doyle, who... Um, uh, published under the pseudonym HB, um, and uh, this image from December 1836 is print a scene from Hudibras. Uh, like many of, of Doyle's work, uh, elusively refers to a literary text, a kind of mock ethic by by Butler, uh, 18th century text, Hudibras. But um, I think importantly for us, uh, satirizes the kind of differences between. Sharma Crawford presented here as the kind of Puritan, ascetic, um, uh, mean figure shackled together 
uh, with the kind of Falstaffian uh, O'Connell. The, the, the text says this represents the knight O'Connell and the squire in hot dispute within an ace of falling out. Um, so what is less often remarked, but perhaps of similar importance, were the, the sharp divisions between these two uh, individuals over the principle of an Irish poor law as well as the tithe. After some indecision, O'Connell came out against a poor law, any poor law for Ireland, in 1836 on both paternalist and um, polit orthodox political economy grounds. Uh, Crawford, in contrast, was committed to, to a poor law on grounds of social justice, albeit, he emphasised this very strongly, without uh, the sort of workhouse test uh, that had been introduced in England in 1834. They clashed on this issue, a poor law for Ireland, not only in Parliament and the, 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 the parliamentary debate, but also, and potentially more seriously for O'Connell, in a series of public meetings in Dublin, um, in the during the recesses in 1836 and 1837, where Sharman Crawford was joined in making the case for an Irish poor law, both by the Belfast-based Catholic radical John Lawless and by the uh, Dublin radical priest Thaddeus O'Malley, who had the, the support of many uh, of the more socially conscious Catholic parochial clergy. This challenge to O'Connell's authority, as well as the heated dispute on the tithe bill happening at the same time, led O'Connell to instigate the effective deselection of Sharman Crawford by his electoral committee in Dundalk in the lead up to the 1837 uh, general election. His rationalisation for this was that by undermining the Whig alliance, Sharman Crawford had betrayed the national interest for hostility to the Mulgrave government of Ireland, Lord Mulgrave's the Lord Lieutenant. Uh, hostility to the Mulgrave government of Ireland is, in my humble opinion, tantamount to hostility to the people of Ireland. It will certainly find few responses amongst the hitherto misgoverned Irish nation. Now, this collapse of, of the relationship with the O'Connellites appeared to ha hit Sharman Crawford hard. It kind of cl slams closed um, that door of a potential, at least for the time being, of a potential alliance with uh, Southern Mass politics. He told, he wrote to his son, uh, John, in early 1837, I will not stand again for that place, Dundalk, or any Catholic constituency, or any constituency at all, while this miserable, perfidious, disquieting policy is to be proceeded with. No honest man can be of the least use. All that I care about now is to preserve my own honour and character and while I am in Parliament, steadily and boldly to maintain my own principles by my votes or otherwise. And of course, that parliamentary career would some come, soon come to an end with the, uh, with the calling of an election within a few months. A newspaper letter war of recrimination with O'Connell uh, that followed would culminate with a very public confrontation between the two men in the Precursor Society in Dublin uh, in 1838, um, where the liberator publicly belittled his former ally, uh, who now very uh, publicly distanced himself from his former repeal sentiments. Out of Parliament, and with the strategy of an accommodation with O'Connell now in tatters, Sharman Crawford now turned to trying to build up his own political base in the North. Despite his O'Connellite period, he appears to have re re retained uh, a high degree of political popularity, uh, especially in his, if you like, his immediate uh, political hinterland in North Down. This was manifested in uh, political dinners in his honour, which focused on his commitment to land reform um, and also to the, a voluntarist settlement to, to tithe. So these seem to have been more important issues to um, to his supporters in the North than his um, perhaps um, conditional support for repeal. Orthodox Presbyterian sentiment, he noted himself in 1835, was increasingly supportive of him on these issues. And notwithstanding his still at least nominal adherence to repeal, he was lauded at meetings of the Belfast Reform Association and at celebratory dinners in the, in the town in uh, 1836 and 1837. And a radically alternative political direction appeared to offer itself to him um, just at this time. Using political connections developed during his sojourn at Westminster, he now began to associate himself with the Demotic Radical Movement uh, growing in strength in Great Britain. 
And indeed, he was one of the six MPs. The others included uh, J.A. Roebuck and indeed O'Connell himself, uh, who were invited in June 1837 by the London Working Men's Association to assist in drafting what became the People's Charter. Uh, and uh, the, the document that would form the basis of the uh, mass campaign for democratic parliamentary reform. Published in May 1838, the six points of the People's Charters, Charter set out um, the, these objectives, annual parliaments, universal, universal suffrage, equal voting districts, no property qualifications, voting by ballot, and payment of MPs. Uh, so this constituted the foundation document of the Chartist movement that would attract mass working class support in Great Britain in the following years. Um, Fergus O'Connor, like Sharman Crawford, an Irish landed Protestant radical, alienated from O'Connell, um, uh, quickly asserted himself uh, as the leader of the movement in the English North um, through fiery platform speaking and the establishment and leads of what became the preeminent Chartist newspaper. Um, the Northern Star. So uh, potentially Sharman Crawford might have followed the same path into kind of basic, uh, into a kind of full scale relocation uh, into uh, British working class politics. And indeed, he's even as early as, as 1836, uh, late 1836, early 1837, he is receiving offers um, to stand as a radical a candidate for Scottish constituencies, but he hesitates to follow this path perhaps due to reservations about the strength of the physical force element um, developing in Chartism that would become um, particularly manifest in the Risings of 1839. And it should be noted, perhaps, that uh, O'Connor, uh, while he is much uh, in common with Charman Crawford, uh, had differences as well. He, he had a strong and unembarrassed family tie to the United Irishmen, uh, perhaps more so than to the volunteers. And indeed, in, in breaking with O'Connell, very publicly in 1836, uh, O'Connor also lost his uh, political base in County Cork to the O'Connellites in a way which perhaps wasn't uh, to the same extent with Sharman Crawford. In 1840, Sharman Crawford sought to establish in the north of Ireland an autonomous political organisation that would pursue there some of the char of the constitutional objectives of Chartism, independently of O'Connell's influence. This body, the Ulster Constitutional Association, was established in alliance with the County Down reformer and indeed future MP for Belfast, David Ross. Echoing his inheritance, Crawford hoped it would operate on the model of the Volunteers of 1782 with the aim of uniting Liberals of all classes in support of constitutional liberty. Now, Crawford himself was in good standing, as, uh, as far as I can see, with, the, with working class organised interests in Belfast. Uh, not least through his role as intervening as an honest broker during a number of industrial disputes in the 1830s, particularly affecting the town's weavers, and indeed then subsequently of being a, a vocal supporter of the 10 hours uh, movement to restrict um, the hours of labour. However, the working class in Belfast was, was fractured along sectarian lines, with strong support for O'Connell amongst Catholic workers uh, being mobilised by, particularly by the Vindicator newspaper, edited from 1839 by Charles Gavin Duffy. Uh, O'Connell's explicit denunciation of the new organisation, the Ulster uh, Constitutional Association, echoed by the Vindicator, rendered its success with this group, uh, Catholic, Catholic workers, uh, unlikely. And indeed, O'Connell's visit to the town in early 1841, which was intended to shore up repeal support um, amongst the Catholic community, had the effect, uh, the, the counterproductive effect of provoking a riot and um, continued sectarian polarisation. So in this context, Sherman Crawford's attempts to persuade the Ulster Constitutional Association to endorse radical political reform were perhaps doomed to fa fa failure. Unlike in, in the north of England, there was no kind of organised, mobilised, unified working class movement pushing um, for a radical agenda um, uh, on, on the organisation. And indeed, his attempts uh, to get the Constitutional Association, even to adopt the more limited objective of household suffrage, suffrage failed to pass in the face of 
moderate liberal resistance. And in, in, in the wake of this, he felt um, obliged to abandon the initiative. So it's perhaps with, it came as some relief to him after this failure uh, in Belfast to be offered an opportunity to return to Parliament, albeit for an English constituency. As early as June 1840, he'd been approached by a committee of electors of the borough of Rochdale in Lancashire, uh, comprising a coalition of uh, liberal and chartist interests. Sharman Crawford's early adherence to the Anti-Corn Law League had made him an attractive catch to the middle-class radicals of the constituency, led by uh, the young John Bright, uh, uh, who was a member of one of the, the kind of leading Quaker families in, in the town, Quaker manufacturing families. While at the same time, his combination of pronounced voluntarism in a predominantly non-conformist town and his association with the original People's Charter attracted the well-organised Chartist bloc led by Thomas Livesey. He's saying that non-conformist politics, uh, working-class politics, were, were very uh, strongly uh, advanced in, in, uh, in um, Rochdale and kind of paved the way for this kind of cross-class radical alliance. Uh, Crawford, Sharma Crawford's election uh, as MP for Rochdale in 1841 was hailed by the by Fergus O'Connor's Northern Star as a victory for the Chartist movement. He is he is kind of uh, um, praised as a, a char- mentioned as a Chartist MP, and indeed Sharman Crawford subsequently took his commitment to this, the uh, the People's Charter seriously, leading a series of abortive parliamentary campaigns uh, to introduce bills for democratic reform in the early 1840s. Um, so none of which, of course, um, went anywhere. Uh, at the same time, however, he could not avoid being drawn into the internecine divisions that split the Chartist movement, uh, particularly when he opted to back Joseph Sturge's uh, Universal Suffrage Union, which uh, quite logically, given his position in Rochdale, um, sought uh, to pursue a middle-class alliance between uh, radical middle-class reformers and chartists uh, in sympathy with the twin objectives of um, uh, democratic reform and repeal of the Corn Laws, but but very much in the face of the overt and very bitter hostility of Fergus O'Connor and the Northern Star. So this may have curbed any leadership ambitions he may have had within wider British charters and there's a very bruising division with with O'Connor. But it was... um, at least acceptable to his supporters in Rochdale, uh, where the cross-class radical alliance, which had been absent in Belfast and absent in many uh, industrial other industrial uh, cities in the north of England, um, however, uh, continued uh, to uh, hold salience and ensured his uncontested re-election as MP for Rochdale in 1847. So this relatively secure tenure of an English parliamentary seat gave him a platform from which to pursue two political objectives relevant to his core uh, political agenda. Uh, Despite the spectacular falling out with O'Connell in the mid-30s, Sharma Crawford never lost sight of the reality that repeal had come to dominate the Irish political environment and that any patriot political initiative had to seek some form of accommodation with it. Um, So one approach rooted in the conditional terms of his early engagement with repeal was to explore whether a moderated form might be identified acceptable to uh, public opinion in Ireland in in both the North and the South and possibly also to British interests. His attempted solution to this conundrum, tabled in the more conducive atmosphere following the suspension of the mass outdoor repeal, year agitation in 1843 was federalism. Sharma Crawford invested a significant amount of intellectual effort into conceptualising and articulating a federalist alternative to simple repeal in 1843 to 44. He declared himself an adherent to a federalist constitutional arrangement in letters to the press in the summer of 1843 while resisting calls that he should join the repeal association. So federalism, as he articulates it, is an independent position to which he seeks to win repealers over to rather than a pathway back into mainstream repeal politics. Federalism was, he asserted, 
a position he had long supported. It was the logic of his early uh, writings on repeal. Um, and put simply, it meant the creation of quote, a legislative body for the purposes of local legislation, combined with an imperial representation for imperial purposes. Such an arrangement would meet the necessity of Irish autonomy over internal affairs, while at the same time securing British strategic interests, without acknowledging without the acknowledgement of which um, any form of repeal could never pass, as well as ensuring that there was some continuing Irish influence over British imperial policy, that is, you know, uh, foreign policy, uh, defence, uh, external trade. The initiative was seen both as an attempt to wean O'Connell away from a fruitless confrontation with the British state, and also to win over Irish Presbyterians who were also potentially alienated by British mistreatment in the early 1840s. O'Connell initially saw this as an opportunity, as, as I said, uh, to lure Sharman Crawford back into the fold, but with the repeated setbacks to his repeal campaign uh, in the latter months of 1843, including his trial and brief imprisonment for sedition in 1844, um, uh, he seems to have started to shift his ground, at least for a time, and to take the, uh, the Federalist alternative more seriously. Hopes for a success were further raised in late 1843 when the Belfast MP and Crawford's former ally David Ross declared himself also a Federalist, although still an opponent of repeal. Um, so for, for some uh, uh, adv advocates of, rep of uh, Federalism, this is very much um, a kind of sh shift from a kind of simple unionism towards something uh, more, uh, a, more, of a more of a compromise form of politics. Meanwhile, Thaddeus O'Malley, who had of course worked with Crawford on the poor law question, endorsed also endorsed the Federalist initiative and called on repealers to support it. So there is kind of um, there are allies kind of attempting to draw their supporters into this Federalist initiative from from both sides. Encouraged by this, Sharman Crawford prepared a series of position papers in eighteen forty three and forty four, setting to address the practicalities of how such a constitutionalist program might work, defining its boundaries uh, between local and imperial responsibilities and the role of what the Irish representatives might be at Westminster, what type of business they could vote on and which would be reserved. He considered the Canadian Constitution of 1840 as a potential model and proposed also um, that Scotland and England might also consider the establishment of uh, federal assemblies uh, beneath the kind of sovereign authority of the imperial parliament. Federalism all round, if you like. In October 1844, O'Connell appeared to commit his organisation to supporting federalism uh, and even to offer Sharman Crawford the, the position of leading the movement, much to the alarm of con con conservative press opinion in both Ireland and England. The ultra-conservative Dublin warder um, denounced Sharman Crawford as a very shallow pated theorist, a man of no talents of any kind, and yet suspecting as all blockhead, blockheads do that his is not that, that he is notwithstanding a very clever fellow. Um, the Cork Examiner, meanwhile, was opining that the opposition British Whigs might be coming might also be coming around to an arrangement on the subject, and for a brief moment in October of eighteen forty four it looked as if an unlikely political breakthrough might be in the offering. However, it was also strongly opposed. The nation and uh, the Young Irelanders were very overtly hostile to what they saw as a, as a dilution of the principle of repeal and nationality. Um, and there's also very little real evidence that any uh, of any British movement on the subject, indeed that the Whig leaning Morning Chronicle warned that um, federalism, as much as simple repeal, must lead to separation and civil war. O'Connell's unlikely rapprochement with, with Sharman Crawford was not to last. In mid November 1844, under pressure from Young Ireland, he rejected the scheme and reverted to unconditional repeal. And we see in, in the uh, repeal press then a kind of uh, a, a kind of, uh, campaign of vituperation um, against um, Sharma Crawford emerging again. So for example, with a letter published um, in the Freeman's Journal from a Mayo priest, uh, a letter to the Repeal Association, 
um, summing up the symbolism of what committed nationalists believed to be at stake. Ireland is struggling to be a nation, and Mr Crawford would fain to, to render perpetual her colonial condition and character. And of course the field initiative became also an object of mockery. John Doyle in London returned to it and depicted it as you can see in uh, in this um, uh, satire, dropping it like a red hot, hot poker, a favourite clown and pantaloon trick lately performed in Ireland, uh, representing it as a clown show with O'Connell, Sharman Crawford and the nation all playing their uh, their parts in this farce. Uh, O'Connell dropping the red hot poker of of uh, of, of federalism uh, under pressure from from Young Ireland. For his part, Sharman Crawford preoccupied uh, it, during these months by the fatal illness and then by the death of his wife Mabel in late 1844, let the initiative slip away, and the issues of federalism would not really be seriously debated again until Gladstone put together his first Home Rule Bill in 1885-6. to six. Now the last of Sherman Crawford's interventions in Ulster politics uh, were arguably, despite its failure to attain its ostensible, ostensible outcomes, the most successful, certainly the most popular. As a county down landlord, he had taken a decision early to give full and unfettered recognition of tenant right on his estates according to the unwritten practice of the Ulster custom. The meaning of tenant right was, and, and indeed remains, uh, highly contested and, and, and very slippery. But as Sharman Crawford understood it, in practice, it, it hinged on the right of the tenant to sell freely his interest in his holding, determined by market rates, on quitting, the farm, quitting his farm for any reason. With the right of the landlord restricted to uh, approval of the incoming tenant and the payment of the commercial value of tenant right if he take, took the land into his own hands, as opposed to uh, giving it, allowing um, an incoming tenant to take possession. Now, Charman Crawford was far from unique amongst Ulster landlords uh, in recognising the custom, but he was unusual to the extent to which he was prepared to recognise what amounted in practice to joint ownership of the land and to accompany it by self-imposed restrictions on rent values determined by the, uh, the, changing, um, uh, the changing prices of uh, farm products. And indeed in um, uh, 1840, 49, 1850, as, as um, uh, agricultural prices are falling rapidly, he uh, puts together a, quite a complex mechanism uh, which uh, w w seeks to regulate the rent of uh, farms on his estate by against um, the, uh, the the kind of the value of a bundle of uh, farm uh, commodities. Now this involved the voluntary surrender of a portion of the economic rent of his estates, a practice that led to some strains within his his own family. However, his personal practice not only rendered him very popular with his tenants, but also drew encomiums uh, on him as a model landlord, even from his political opponents. From his first entry into Parliament in 1835, one of his principal objectives was to provoke debate on legislation with the aim of legalising some version of the Ulster tenant right, under the argument that this would be calculated both to address the crisis of tenant insecurity, which he saw as the root cause of endemic agra agrarian violence, and to promote investment of labour and capital by the tenants in the improvement of their own holdings and thereby improving agricultural pro productivity overall. His annual bill, or near annual bill, that he, had, uh, he admitted on its first appearance in 1835 was aimed to get these principles discussed with a view to eventual adoption, preferably by being taken up by government. Um, he explained uh, his aim uh, in a letter to the Northern Whig uh, in 1836 as being um, the aim of the bill being to end the master-slave relationship of dependency into neural relations and to replace it with one based on mutual interdependence of landlord and tenant. Now the bill acquired little uh, public uh, uh, attention uh, in the mid-1830s beyond its dismissal uh, in Parliament as, as Crawford's crotchet. It acquired more traction by the time he returned to the Commons 
1841. In the interim, he had published a tract in 1839 in, uh, entitled In Defence of the Small Farmers of Ireland, an anti-Malthusian justification for the viability and potential profitability of small-scale agriculture under supportive legislation, uh, a text that was widely uh, and in Ireland largely positively reviewed. <clears throat> As the O'Connellite movement uh, uh, shifted haltingly towards a more advanced position on land reform in the early 1840s, it found much to admire in Crawford's text, uh, a fact that tended to soften the previous asperities between him uh, and the Econolites over tithe and repeal, and to enhance his standing as an all-Ireland spokesman on the subject. So Crawford's bill, um, uh, while well, it, it is based on the principle and the uh, the ideal of Ulster tenant right uh, aims to compensate tenants for retrospective improvements and hence to make that form of tenant security universal across the entire island rather than simply recognising the position in Ulster itself. Sharman Crawford's series of, of bills uh, introduced into Parliament resumed uh, with his return as MP for Rochdale at a time when government could no longer afford to ignore the Irish land question. He took some credit for pressing the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, into establishing a commission of inquiry into the Irish land question chaired by Lord Devon from 1843 and indeed gave extensive evidence to it in defence of the Ulster custom. Following its report in 1845, he placed himself at the forefront of parliamentary opposition to a series of government land bills, first by the Peel government and then after 1846 by the succeeding Whig ministry, on the grounds that by ignoring tenant right and offering only moderate compensation for prospective improvements by tenants, these threatens to, threaten to undermine rather than enhance the security of existing small tenants. So not any form of... Uh, the objective was not to get any form of... of um, uh, of, of land or tenant uh, uh, legislation, but a form which rec recognised property in the soil created by retrospective um, improvements by tenants. Two developments combined to provide at least the potential for turning this largely solitary parliamentary crusade into a mass movement in the later 1840s. First was the onset of the Great Famine. Charman Crawford's sustained critique of Whig relief policy in Parliament and the press and ultimately in a second anti-Malthusian pamphlet, Depopulation Not Necessary, first published in 1849, proposed the provision of relief on a reproductive scheme to reclaim west wastelands and settle them with tenant smallholders, which further enhanced his political standing in Ireland. Although County Down was affected uh, much less severely than western and southern districts, distress was real here as well. Uh, and the collapse of commodity prices after 1847 hit tenant farmers hard and reduced the value of tenant right payments to a nominal level um, uh, uh, during a period of growing rent arrears. Fears of acute vulnerability, enhanced by reports of wide, widespread landlord clearances in other parts of Ireland and overt threats to the existence of tenant right made by some landlords in the north, created a much more favourable climate for outdoor agitation on the land question. At the same time, local leadership for such a movement was offered in the north by a core of radical evangelical Presbyterian clergy, supported by a number of newspapers, principally the Londonderry Standard and the Banner of Ulster, which from 1843 took an advanced position on the land question and urged, had urged at that time Sharman Crawford to put himself at the head of such a movement. The key figure in the establishment of the Ulster Tenant Right Association in mid-1847 and its subsequent emergence as a significant political force was the editor of the London Derry Standard and subsequently the letter of the, the editor of the Banner of, of Ulster, James McKnight. Both Gerald Hall and Frank Wright have traced the development and dynamics of the tenant right movement in the North in some detail and persuasively argued that the death of O'Connell in 1847 and the subsequent collapse of the repeal movement cleared the way for an effective, if still very wary, cross communal cooperation on a campaign focused on a legislative objective of land reform. Attention has been given to the discrepancy between the utilitarian case for tenant right advocated in Parliament by Sharman Crawford, emphasising the recognition of the value created by tenants through previous improvements, rather than the less tangible interest as understood in the Ulster custom, and the more essentialist case 
for security or fixity of tenure articulated in historicist terms by McKnight in the North and by Catholic advocates such as Frederick Lucas in the South. And this is accurate, but reflects more a tactical than a fundamental difference on the part of Sharman Crawford, when faced with a parliament suffused with political economic discourses. His argument at Westminster was that tenant right was a legitimate form of property, created by the tenant's labour that required equal legal protection to landlord property rights. As such, it was applicable throughout the island and not just in Ulster. This did not preclude him from recognition of more essentialist forms of tenant right in addresses to Ulster farming bodies, especially given his well-known acknowledgement of free sale on his own estates. Amid the emphasis given to the dynamics of Presbyterian radicalism in the tenant right campaign of 1847 to 52, Crawford's role has perhaps been somewhat overlooked. Not only did his long-standing parliamentary campaign offer a focus for a non-violent mass, uh, mass agitation, but he also served as a symbolic locus of unity between the northern and southern wings of the movement. In a post-O'Connell environment, his principled and widely reported critique of Whig famine policies marked him out, especially in the wake of the disastrous outcome of the Confederate Rising in 1848, as a figure acceptable to Catholic opinion. Indeed, you know, in, in polar opposite from uh, the letter published uh, rather earlier, one uh, uh, priest wrote to the um, Freeman's Journal in 1851 describing Sharman Crawford as the living father of his country. Reinventing himself politically as a, as a radical land reformer from 1849, Charles Gavin Duffy, previously a strong critic of Sharma Crawford, also now regarded him as a potential political ally. Now, there's not the time here to address the fraught dynamics of the League of North and South, as it was called by, by uh, Gavin Duffy, which developed from 1850, except to note the priority which tenant league leaders uh, gave to courting an initially reluctant Sharman Crawford to join them at the forefront of the movement and the lengths they were prepared to go to suppress more radical agrarian demands within the movement in favour of an official consensus of unity around his bill which became the kind of the, the kind of centrepiece of the tenant rights demands which continued to stress the centrality of compensation for retrospective improvements as the basic basis of a practical tenant right. Unity of this movement was, of course, not to last. It was vulnerable to sectarian disruption, particularly in the wake of the uh, of the uh, um, uh, highly sectarian discourses uh, generated by the, uh, the, the so-called papal aggression and the government's ecclesiastical titles bill in 1851. Um, and the very assertive and overtly Catholic political agenda adopted by many of the supporters of the Tenant League uh, in, in the wake of this crisis. Um, also, it was vulnerable to the political opportunism of figures such as John Sadler, and indeed to the reduction of tenant enthusiasm, uh, which began to take place as the ag agricultural economy began to recover in the early 1850s. And ultimately, the, the League collapsed as an all-island body. Sharman Crawford himself suffered a humiliating final defeat in County Down in summer 1852 when he contested the county on a tenant right ticket, uh, only to be, to, be, to be beaten again uh, by the combined weight of the Hill and Stuart interests, still the dominant political force in the county, assisted, however, in this case by the assertion of... Uh, an orange pan Protestant feeling um, stirred up in, in, in reaction to the kind of overt Catholic politics of the uh, Catholic Defence Association. Although still regarded, highly regarded for his integrity and his consistency, this marked the end of Sharman Crawford's political career. So in conclusion then, what can we discern from this busy uh, but overall rather frustrated political career? Despite the numerous setbacks, he was relatively successful in articulating a revived radical patriot tradition derived from the more advanced wing of the volunteer movement in the changed conditions of the 1830s and uh, 40s and early 50s. Following the logic of patriotism, he regarded British governance of Ireland, which it, of course was direct uh, following the Union, as demonstrably ineffective and counterproductive, though this would not be addressed, he thought, by the Catholic nationalist majoritarianism that would follow from simple repeal. 
Hence his attempts to define a pragmatic federalist alternative that he hoped might meet Catholic aspirations for uh, national self-government while delivering for Protestants good governance of, of Ireland within the security of a defined British connection. Now, while this failed, it did come close to, to being at least seriously considered in late 1844. Um, and even that failed to, uh, even that the adherence to federalism failed to damage him in the eyes of most Ulster Presbyterians. His engagement with Chartist ideas, which was more than the, the brief flirtation suggested by Hall, provided not only the pragmatic advantage of a safe seat at Rochdale, but at least the possibility of a democratic political alternative to the increasingly more abundant Whiggery of the Belfast middle class liberal leadership. And while this was abortive in the specific conditions of Belfast in 1840-41, to it at least paved the way for the more assertively democratic politics evident in the Tenant League. And finally, his engagement with the land question was informed not only by a sensitivity to local custom um, and the political advantages of defending it, but to a deeply held commitment to a sense of equitable social justice between social classes, which could and should be attained through non-violent constitutional mobilisations in support of a parliamentary objective. If the energy behind the tenant movement in Ulster came from McKnight and his Presbyterian clerical allies, the essential focus of their campaign, and the only option allowing them to establish a coalition beyond Ulster Presbyterian territory, was provided by Sharman Crawford um, and his tenant right bill. Where Sharman Crawford failed in 1852, his son James, standing as a Liberal in the wake of the Secret Ballot Act, uh, was to succeed in 1874, when County Down was at last wrested from Conservative control, at least briefly, on a land reform ticket. The failure of the revived Ulster Presbyterian liberalism of the 1870s to negotiate a modus vivendi with the Land League and the Home Rule Movement is the subject for another paper. But what is significant here is that without William Sharman Crawford, it may not have survived as a coherent political force for even that long. I'll give the last word to um, uh, an example of, uh, of, the, of the memory of William Sharman Crawford. Um, this is... Um, uh, an extract from um, a book published in Belfast in 1877 called The Annals of Ulster Tenant Right by an Antrim Tenant Farmer, uh, which combines text and, as you can see here, uh, illustrations, images of the um, kind of all the idealised uh, consequences of the Irish 1870 Land Act, Gladstone's first Land Act of 1870, which recognises um, both uh, Ulster Tenant Right um, and the principle of compensation for improvements. So we have the Irish Rent Office before the passing of the Land Act uh, with the, the, um, the, the tenant farmer humiliated and uh, debased before the land agent. Um, and then after the Land Bill of 1870, um, the two of them put on equal standing uh, with the, the land agent forced to, to co cooperate and to, uh, to, to treat the tenant farmer as an equal. And the anonymous author of this tract uh, tells us uh, in very sort of um, uh, popular language, yes, sir, I repeat it, the name of William Ewart Gladstone, coupled with that of Sharman Crawford, will always hold a favoured place in the esteem and affections of tenant farmers of Ulster. Their memories will stretch out beyond the little temporary shuffling of political popularity and the abuse of the Ulster Constitutional Party, whose poison tongues strove to malign and insult when they could not meet them in argument or thwart them in debate. So thank you very much.